Greetings, church, and to the rest of our friends joining us online. I'm Pastor Gabe, thanking you for watching this presentation of our Sunday morning service. Today, we're beginning a series on prayer, and I will be preaching from Matthew chapter 6 if you want to grab a Bible and join with me there. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel because the moment a new sermon is uploaded, you will get an alert. And you can also listen to good Bible teaching seven days a week. In addition to the sermon being uploaded to the podcast, I'm preaching through the scriptures every day of the week. And you can subscribe by going to www.utt.podbean.com. Please remember your giving to our church. You can send a check in the mail to First Southern Baptist Church, 1220 West 8th Street, Junction City, Kansas, 66441. Or donate online when you go to jcbaptist.net. We are a nonprofit organization, so your donations are tax deductible. Here in a moment, we've got a worship song followed by the sermon, and then there will be a closing hymn as well. But let me begin by reading to you from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come behold the wondrous mystery In the dawning of the King He the theme of heaven's praises Robed in frail humanity In our longing, in our darkness Now the light of life has come Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us.
Good morning. Open your Bible, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. Today we are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer and spend a few weeks in this particular passage of Scripture. Now, when we get to that part in our reading where Jesus gives us the lesson on how to pray, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. We'll do it in the King James English because I think that's how most of us memorized it when we were younger. So it'll be our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We'll use the words debt and debtors, and we will conclude with for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray this together every week that we come to this particular section of Scripture. These are the words of our Lord Christ in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the synagogues and on the street, uh, the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're going to spend the next several weeks studying on how to pray. And it's interesting here that as Jesus begins these instructions to his disciples, he starts off by telling them how not to pray. As we go over this passage, we're going to divide this up into twos. We have how not to pray followed by how to pray. And within how not to pray, we have this divided up into hypocrites and Gentiles. Under how to pray, we have the Lord's Prayer divided up into divine exaltation and personal petition. We'll spend most of our time today regarding Jesus' instructions on how not to pray like the hypocrites. Next week, we're going to look at how not to pray like the Gentiles. And then for the weeks that follow, we're going to concentrate on the various parts of the Lord's Prayer. What we want to glean from this as believers is a healthy practice of right, biblical, God-honoring prayer. I hope that as we go through these lessons together, it will improve your discipline, the spiritual discipline of prayer. When it comes to spiritual disciplines, you may be like me. Prayer is just not one of those things that comes to you naturally. Now, of course, it it doesn't come naturally to anybody. It's a supernatural enterprise to converse with the Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, who is spirit, who is invisible. Even here, Jesus describes the Father as being in secret. But when I say that it doesn't come to you naturally to pray, I mean that even as a Christian, as someone who is spiritually minded. Prayer is just not the first thing you think about. You're not the kind of person who says, I need to stop what I'm doing and I need to pray. I need to to get away from everybody for a little while and just pray. I need to turn off the TV and the video games and I need to pray. Kids, leave daddy alone for a little bit. I need to go pray. That may not be you. Now, maybe it surprises some of you to hear me say that I don't believe that I'm very good at praying. Recently, our local radio station here in Junction City called me up and asked me to record daily prayers, which they played every day for a month. They loved the way that I prayed and wanted me to do that on the air. And all I did was I prayed the scriptures. I opened up the Psalms or a few places in the New Testament, and I would just pray what was 
on the page. The guy at the radio station recognized what I was doing, and he he texted me and said, I think you plagiarized some of these. I was involved in a community production, and before we went out on stage, the director would ask me to pray. It was a privilege that I got to do before every performance. Now, I knew that most of the cast were not believers, so I would put scripture in my prayers without references. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say exactly what it was I was quoting, but I was quoting scripture, or I would just put the gospel in my prayer. And one night, the director came up to me, and I thought that she was going to tell me to tone it down a little bit. Maybe I was getting too preachy or something like that. But what she said was, can we just have you come and pray before every show that we do, even if you're not in it? I've been privileged to have been asked to pray before military funerals. Brother Dave asked me to pray at a couple of the veterans' motorcycle gatherings. I prayed at the governor's mansion a few years ago when Sam Brownback was governor of Kansas. I highly doubt Governor Kelly would ever ask me to (laughs) to come and pray. Uh, Prisoners at the jail, patients at the hospital have requested that I come and pray with them. I've probably come and prayed with you. Yet... I've never really thought of myself as someone who was very good at prayer. In fact, even when it comes to the act of prayer itself, I'm ashamed to say that more often than not, I hesitate to pray. Now, that's a pride issue. I certainly do not pat myself on the back for that. When we refuse to pray, or when we think that we don't need to pray, that's prideful. Perhaps you know 1 Peter 5, 7, which says, Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's a pretty popular verse. You might even have that printed on a magnet on your fridge or something like that. But consider what is said in the verse right before that, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties, all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Humble yourself and take your concerns before the Lord. If you think that prayer is a last-ditch effort, if you think it's one of those things that you do when all else fails, then you have a wrong attitude about prayer. Prayer should actually be the first thing that we do, not the last. Even here in the Lord's Prayer, you might recognize that Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. He is instructing us to begin the day with prayer. Don't find a place later on somewhere in our day to, to, well, now I've got time. Now I can sit down and talk with the Lord. This is the way that we should start our day. It's the way we should end our day. In fact, the scripture says, pray without ceasing. That was Paul's instruction to the Thessalonians, that we always have a mindset that is mindful of God, that submits our thoughts unto the Lord. There's a famous quote attributed to Martin Luther who said, I have so much to do today, I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Yet for many of us, for most of us, I should say, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. When in the most distressing time of prayer in his life, In that time in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus even sweat drops of blood, he came and found his disciples sleeping, and he said to them, could you not even watch and pray with me for one hour? I would have been just as bad as the disciples. Like I said, most of the time I hesitate to make prayer a priority. As a husband and as a father... I am confessing to you that I've done a poor job leading my family in prayer. So you really have a poor prayer teacher standing in front of you today about to teach you about prayer. This is as pressing upon me as it might be to you. So we're going to learn together. We have a teacher who is even greater than I am, and may the Holy Spirit guide us into all truth as we look into the Word of God and ask the Lord to teach us how to pray. In keeping with Jesus' instructions here, we're going to begin by learning how not to pray, and that's how we're going to focus most of our thoughts 
today, but in the process of doing so, we're also going to be learning how to pray, right? If you're learning how not to do it, you are also learning how to do it. So this is just as important as putting our focus and our attention on how to pray. So important that Jesus decided to mention this first. Notice that in verse 5, it begins, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Remember last week when we began our study in uh, in chapter 6, I said that all of the rest of this chapter flows from verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Taking that theme, Jesus applies that to prayer. Do not pray as though to be seen by others. Pray to your Father who is in secret. Therefore, pray in secret. You're talking to God. Talk to Him, not to everyone else around you. A friend of mine told me about a church that he grew up in, and he said that uh, that pastor's prayers were often funny. And it wasn't unusual to hear some like low-level chuckling in, in, among some people that were around him whenever the pastor would pray because it sounded like he was talking to God, but he was using the pastoral prayer, you know, that, that long prayer that I do during the service. He was using the pastoral prayer to talk to people in the congregation, but not mentioning their names. It would be something like, oh God, we know that you don't like it when a woman comes into our church and her skirt just doesn't come down below the knees. And, and my friend said, some of us younger ones, we would open our eyes and we'd kind of start looking around at the ladies and seeing whose skirt didn't quite, pass, <laughs> didn't quite pass their knees. Who was it that the pastor was talking about this morning? Then the pastor would say something like, Lord, please give some of us when we think that we can start, uh, start cutting back on our tithe. Forgive us for that. We think that nobody will notice. You notice, oh Lord. Can a man rob from God? Maybe we don't need to buy that 70-inch television. Maybe we can settle with the 50-inch and we can give the rest of the building fun. And my friend said, well, we all knew that Brother Bill had just been boasting the week before about a new TV, so we know exactly who it was that he was talking about. That's not praying to God. That's using prayer as a gossip time. And so, so often in our churches, that's... That's the way prayer gets abused. Like it's so often it's practically become cliche. That whole thing of, oh, we we just need to pray for so-and-so, and you're using prayer as an excuse to spread gossip about someone else. You might say, hey, is there anything that I can I can be praying for you about? And, and that's a fine question. We should pray for one another. But what I'm saying here is check your heart. Are you sure that you're genuinely concerned for that person, or are you using that question to treat yourself to some personal information? Avoid using prayer to spread gossip. Hey, Philip, pray for Jack and Gretchen. They're having marriage problems. When it's something personal, whether it's a medical issue or a death in the family or a disagreement or Someone's just going through a difficult time. Make sure you check with that person and ask them if it's okay that you tell somebody else about their need. And maybe even limit it to, can I tell this person and then this person so that we can pray for you together? That way you're able to say when you go to those persons, I've checked with so-and-so and they told me that they were okay with me telling you this. Especially check the intentions of your heart. You may not know the intentions of someone else's heart, but check the intentions of your heart. Do you have a genuine concern for people? Do you desire that your church would be a praying church? Or do you just want to be that guy or gal that everyone thinks is in the know? Do you just want to impress people? Are you using prayer to complain about others? This is another problem that I see regarding our use of prayer. You get some people together and you say, me and -and so-and-so are not getting along right now. I'm having a really difficult time with this. Can you pray for us right now? It might look like a genuine request for prayer, but what you're actually doing is poisoning the well. 
You're trying to get people on your side of a conflict. And if that's your heart, then in your prayer, you are blaspheming God when you use his name. If it's for you and not to benefit others or glorify God, then you're taking God's name in vain. Now, I want to reiterate, there's nothing wrong with asking people to pray for you. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody if there's something that you can pray for them about. The point that I'm making is the point that Jesus is making. Examine yourself and check your heart. What is your motivation? Is this about the Lord or is it about yourself? Do you want the name of God to be exalted? Do you want the person you're praying for to excel? Or do you just want other people to think that you're the exceptional one? Once again, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. May our heart's desire be for God. He should be the very focus of our prayers. If you want to have a healthy practice of prayer, desire God. Don't be like the hypocrites who look to themselves in prayer. If your end game in prayer is to glorify yourself rather than glorify God, then that's going to become evident outwardly as well. Consider the next part of verse 5. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the, tree, at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Now, that's the key part here. They do this to be seen by others. That's their motivation. Jesus is not condemning public prayer. In 1 Timothy 2.8, the apostle says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands. The men of the church are to set an example for the church in prayer. And they do this by leading prayers openly. They keep their hands holy, meaning that they, uh, the, the way they live is consistent with the way that they pray. When a man leads an open public prayer, people hear a man who is consistent in his speech and in his actions. They know his reputation. So when they hear him pray, they know this is a man who is devoted to the Lord. Public prayer praying aloud in church, leading prayer at prayer gatherings or in Bible study, even leading prayer for your own family. These are all good things. So Jesus is not prohibiting public or open prayer. Once again, he's confronting a heart issue, which we've been seeing all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. The hypocrites pray in the synagogues and at the street corners not to glorify God, but so that they would be seen by others. Prayer was a very common practice among the Jews. Twice a day, at sunrise and at sunset, the Jews would pray the Shema. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. It's the passage that begins, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. They prayed that section of Scripture twice a day. Then there were the public prayers in the synagogues and at the temple using a liturgy, meaning that these prayers were written out. They were traditional prayers. Everyone knew them and everyone recited them. Then there was the tefillah, a series of benedictions recited two to three times a day. Then there were the offering prayers, which were at 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m., this practice was derived from a legalistic rendering of Psalm 55, 17. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. And we also see uh, in Daniel 6, 10 that Daniel prayed three times a day. So the, the scribes and the Pharisees would take these examples from the Old Testament, and they, they would apply this to this legalistic practice of, play, uh, of praying at exactly these three times every day. And that was, that was a requirement for Jews. If they wanted to be holy, they had to pray like this. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John went into the temple for the hour of prayer at the ninth hour, and everybody was going in to pray. That was the, the story where they uh, healed the lame beggar at the, beautiful gate, at the beautiful gate. So it was one of those offering prayers uh, when they performed, these, uh, performed this miracle. There was also a prayer called the Minha, that coincided with the time of the daily burnt offering in the temple. 
You had mealtime prayers, and then there were prayers after the meal was over. You probably pray before a meal, and the Jews would also pray after the meal. So as you can see, prayer was a regular practice for the Jews. The problem was that it had become very mechanical. They did it, but they didn't really mean it. And this was the very issue that Isaiah warned about in Isaiah 29, 13. This people draw near with their mouth and they honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. Jesus quotes this passage in Matthew 15, 8. The Jews were a ridiculously religious people, but it wasn't real. And, and, you know, we have to be careful of that, too, because even as every week we come to recite the Lord's Prayer, as we're going to go through this passage together, we have to be careful that we don't let this become mechanical. But that is something that we genuinely mean before God. It is something that we practice. It gets into our mind and our hearts that we may become more disciplined in our prayer to the Lord. Not more mechanical, but more genuine. Prayer for the sake of prayer is not good. In 2006, the New York Times published an article entitled, Long-Awaited Medical Study Questions the Power of Prayer. The study was conducted over a period of 10 years and had involved more than 1,800 patients, all of whom were recovering from heart surgery. And the basic conclusion to the story was this. Prayer doesn't work. According to the study, prayer by strangers had no effect on the recovery time of patients undergoing heart surgery, whether they knew they were being prayed for or not. I remember when the results of this uh, study were released. I was in Christian radio at the time. I think it was even one of the uh, news stories that I had read on the air one day. And just about every atheist on the internet at that time, they fell all over themselves, touting what they claimed was scientific proof that prayer does not work. If atheists had a Bible, they would have entered this study into canon. I mean, it was the greatest pseudoscience since Darwinism. I still get this bunk study thrown at me, uh, you know, even 14 years later. There was an internet atheist at the time who had made a hobby horse out of me, he, he went by simply the name Zero online, and on his blog, he wrote an entire article calling me out, saying that this study concluded once and for all just how foolish Christians like Gabe can be, praying to their non-existent sky fairy. He even turned my name into an acronym. Gabe stood for grasping at any biblical excuse. Well, I responded to him. I actually did meet this guy in person before, once before. Um, And I think that this was after this, in fact. But I responded to him online and I said, did you read who was actually involved in this study? And he said, well, yes, everything is true. Everything is verified. But you Christians are so anti-science and anti-data. It wouldn't matter if Einstein conducted the study. You still wouldn't accept it. And I replied, no, I'm not talking about the organization that did the study. I'm not talking about whether or not it was peer-reviewed. I mean, did you look and see who in the study was actually praying for these patients? Those who were praying, the the people who were praying for the patients who were recovering from heart surgery consisted of a contemplative Catholic order called the Teresian Carmelites and a Catholic monastery and convent both of whom deny the gospel that we are justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. There was also a new thought organization called Unity who denies the trinity of God and that even Jesus is incarnate. And he said to me, I suppose you're going to tell me that those groups don't count. And I I simply told him this. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. If anyone prays by any other means than through faith in Jesus, or if anyone thinks that by virtue of their own merit 
They have earned a place before the Father. God does not hear their prayers. How do we know that God does not hear the prayer of a Muslim? Because they reject that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's even written in the Quran, 4.171. Exalted is Allah above having a son. How do we know that God does not hear the prayer of an Orthodox Jew? Because they likewise reject that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. How do we know that God does not listen to the prayer of a Jehovah's Witness? Because they believe that Jesus is a created being. In fact, that he's the archangel Michael. How do we know that God does not listen to the prayer of a Mormon? Because likewise, they believe what Joseph Smith said about Jesus, that he is a created being. They believe in a different Jesus who is the literal brother of Satan, not the creator of all things. God does not receive every prayer. No matter how solemn or religious the ceremony that the prayer came from. I went on to tell Zero the Atheist, even if the study had concluded that the patients who were prayed for recovered faster than those who received no prayer, I still would have rejected the study as legitimate. In Matthew 4, 7, Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I'm going to continue believing what the Bible says, not what the New York Times says. I think you and I would agree that the Apostle Paul was a man who was more righteous, more humble than anyone else in this room. And he said in 2 Corinthians 12 that a messenger of Satan was sent to torment him, and three times he prayed that the Lord would take it away. And you know this story. I, I mentioned it to you time and time again. How did the Lord answer him? Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Now, you might look at that answer and you, and you might say, why didn't God answer Paul? But he did answer his prayer. In fact, Jesus answered Paul with the greatest answer, himself. And Paul was content with that answer. Jesus' answer was himself. And Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My friends, if you think that God does not answer prayer because you did not get the answer that you wanted, could it be that the answer you rejected was Christ himself? Could it be that the answer that you thought was not sufficient enough for you was Jesus, who is sufficient for our every need? As we have read from Psalm 34 this morning, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 that when we make our requests of God, we make our requests with thanksgiving. You can ask of God, thankful for everything that he has given to you, not needing anything but what he has already provided for you through his Son. And it's in that same instruction that Paul says not to be anxious about anything, but with thanksgiving present your request to God. My friends, you can express your griefs even when it's in a spirit of thanksgiving, can you not? Thankful to the Lord for having dealt bountifully with you, even though in your present circumstance you may feel troubled. The Bible tells us that there are other conditions for prayer. In Isaiah 1.15, the Lord said to wayward Israel, When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Unless what? Isaiah 66.2, This is the one to whom I will look. The one who is humble and contrite in spirit 
and who trembles at my word. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. When we love our sin and do not confess our sin, God does not listen to our prayers. In 1 Peter 3, 7, we are told, Strife in a marriage hinders our prayers. James 1, 6 says, The one who doubts will not receive from the Lord. James 4, 3 says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So consider with me, if you will, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which says, If my people who are called by my name, brothers and sisters in the Lord, followers of Jesus Christ, that's you and me. That's not the United States of America, as this verse is often applied to. That's anyone who bears the name as a son or a daughter of God adopted into his family by faith in Jesus Christ. That's who has been called by his name. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So what do we have in our prayers? We have being humble before God. We are seeking God. We are turning from everything that is against God. And he says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal. Only then will I heal their land. The hypocrites are not humble. They do not seek God's glory, but their own, and they do not turn from their wicked ways because they think that they're righteous by their own merit. That's why they're, they're standing out there. That's the whole reason why they're praying loudly in the temples and on the street corners, lifting up their voices so that you hear them pray, so that you would look upon them and be awed at just how righteous they are. So they're not confessing themselves before God. They're boasting it and proclaiming their own righteousness. Truly I say to you, Jesus says, they've received their reward. What they wanted was to be recognized by men. That's what they got. And they're not going to get anything else other than that. As I said to you last week, that's, that's a scary condemnation. That all you're going to get is the recognition of people, but not the recognition of God. Instead of the public places to be seen by others, Jesus tells you where you should go to discipline yourself that your prayer habits would be about God and not about yourself. Look finally at verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room. Some of you, some of your translations say go into your closet. Shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret, the invisible God, who knows hearts and minds, who tests the thoughts of man to see if they love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, the Father who sees in secret will reward you. And that is good news. It's not about your works. It's not about the recognition of man. It is about the glory of God. And at the proper time, as Peter says, he will exalt you. James repeats the same thing, in fact. Now, don't let these warnings about hypocritical prayer, praying to be seen by others, or even conditions for genuine prayer, don't let these things hinder you from praying at all. You might be thinking, goodness, there's just so much here. All those qualifications. How can I be certain that I'm doing it right? My friend, it's very simple. Seek God. Do you want to be with God? Then talk to him. You might reply, but God is so holy and I am not. You're right, you're not. But as I said to you when we were going through our study in Galatians, what God demands of you is the very thing that he gives to you. Jesus said in the previous chapter, in Matthew chapter 5, 
Your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. The last verse in Matthew chapter 5, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you have received the righteousness that he demands of you. You have the righteousness of Christ. If you still ask, but how can I be certain that he is listening to me? And the answer is, because the Bible says so. Jesus said in John 14, 13, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, that doesn't mean you ask for a Ferrari in Jesus' name and it will be given to you, because remember, our request in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we ask God that his will be done in our lives to the praise of his glorious grace, it will be done. Jesus has promised us this. We read in 1 John 2, 1, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That word advocate, an advocate is a representative who speaks favorably on behalf of another. So think about that. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is speaking favorably of you before the Father. We read in 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony at the proper time. Romans 8, 26 through 27 says, that the Spirit of God helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. My friend, if you, if you ever enter into such a depression that all you can do is, uh, is lie on the floor and weep, The Holy Spirit of God is interceding for you with groanings that are too deep for words. Jesus is our mediator. He is our advocate. The Holy Spirit, our intercessor, taking our prayers before the Father. And so, as we read in the book of Hebrews, let us enter boldly into the presence of God. For it is Christ who has made us worthy. Now, I want to do something in conclusion here. Uh, Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3. Whenever I have taught someone to pray, if they've asked me, Brother Gabe, how how do I pray? Like, I know I need to be praying more. Can I pray the Psalms? Is that okay? Absolutely, you can pray the Psalms. In fact, you can pray most anything in the Scriptures. And I want to show you, using Colossians 3, how you do that. I did this with a group of men a year ago. I went to Utah and was uh, speaking with a men's group there in Lehigh. And in teaching them how to pray, I showed them from the Scriptures, from Colossians chapter 3. And here's what we read. Let me read the passage first. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If when you are alone with God and you are praying and you're wondering what to pray, pray the scriptures, and maybe it would sound something like this. Heavenly Father, I know that I have been raised with Christ. Help me to seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Help me to set my mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For I have died. I am dead to sin, alive in Christ, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is my life, appears, then I also will appear with him in glory. 
Another way of saying that is the words that we have of the Apostle John at the end of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So you see in just these four verses, you, have a, you are exalting God as holy, you are asking him to help you live rightly and righteously here on this earth, and you are asking the Lord that he would hasten his coming soon to put an end to all of these earthly, worldly things and that God's kingdom would reign forevermore. May this be our attitude in prayer, simply to seek God, to exalt Christ our Savior, the God-man who came down from heaven, put on human flesh, dwelt among us, and now he is our access to God. God has commanded us to pray, but pray because you want to. I come.